when I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I will see ads from these major label artists where they are just using a photograph or as a tour poster. I've never heard of them, so they're clearly targeting cold audiences. And they are trying to sell me either a new album, a pre-order or a tour ticket. And, you know, the chances of me actually seeing a picture or a tour poster and just the band name. And that's the only context I have. And then taking time out of my day to Google them, search them out on Spotify and listen to them before then making a decision as to whether I want to buy the album or uh, buy a tour ticket. It's just never going to happen. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 260. I'm super, super excited to be coming to you today with a story from our IndieX agency. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy, and with me today is a very special guest straight from the IndieX agency, our account strategist, Andy Hunter, who is also the guitarist from the band As December Falls. And he's going to be with us today to share a really interesting case study story from IndieX, which I think will answer a question that a lot of artists have. We'll get into that in a second. Andy, thank you so much for being here, dude. Welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks, man. It's been a hot minute. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm super excited to have you. Um, What we're going to be talking about today, just to kind of loop you guys into a story and a case study that's been going on with one of our clients uh, here at the IndieX agency is around the topic of capitalizing on your momentum. And I think this is a question that a lot of artists have when they've got any degree of movement going on in their career, whether it be they get a little bit of virality, whether they've got a song that's kind of going off. Sometimes they might have a song that got a sync placement. Sometimes, you know, they move on to, you know, a chart position. Uh, I think most artists, when they get some degree of success and kind of momentum happening, they ask, how can I capitalize on this? How can I strike while the, while the iron is hot? And that's exactly what happened with the artists that we're going to be telling the story of today. Our client at IndieX had some momentum going in his career, and he came to us and said, hey, guys, I want to take things to the next level and really kick it, in, kick it up a notch while I've got this momentum happening. So we wanted to share his story because it's pretty impressive and pretty awesome. And hopefully there are some takeaways for you guys to take home and use in your own careers or with the artists that you're working with if you're a manager or a marketer so that you can kind of learn from our experiences and capitalize on the momentum that you've got going on in your camp. So Andy, let's kick it off, man. Share a little bit of the story of what was going on with our client when he came to us. I believe it was about three months ago now, maybe a little more. What was going on in his world? He had momentum going, and I know specifically like strike while the iron is hot. It was really the the key phrase that was kind of getting thrown around uh, with us in meetings. Yeah, for sure. So this artist operates in the blues classic rock kind of space. He's uh, been going for quite a while, had six or uh, actually it might be even more than that. It might be around the 10 album mark. So really lengthy career for this artist. And his last album released at the end of last year. I think it was released around October time, just before he onboarded, went to number one in the Billboard blues charts in the US. That was with the help with a label. The majority of his revenue was was basically coming in from playing shows, a little bit from his online store, but not a huge amount. And so when he onboarded, a big focus was growing his revenue share outside of the label and album sales and trying to focus more on his e-commerce rather than just relying on all of his income coming from shows and then whatever was being brought in by the label. It's a really interesting spot to bring to a conversation and an interesting spot for us to start out with where it's like, I've got a number one spot on this chart here but my e-commerce sales really aren't reflecting that at all or much at all. And I want you guys to kind of flex these muscles. What were his audience sizes looking like? You know, what kind of, I I know you said he had a long, you know, pretty storied career, a whole lot of records, but are we talking about a massive artist? Are we talking about someone who's kind of just built up a fan base over time? Where was he at? I'd say probably more like a mid-level artist, again, who's like built up this really great career, you know, doing it full time on his 10th album. Um, really strong following for his live shows, you know, sell a lot of tickets for his own 
for, for his headline stuff, doing a lot of great support slots. So, you know, I'd probably say that like kind of mid-level artist, you know, we're not talking like millions and millions in terms of audience size, but definitely enough to sustain a, a lengthy full-time career from it. In terms of like, you know, looking at some of his e-commerce stats. So the year before he onboarded, he did about nine and a half thousand dollars in revenue on Shopify. So under a thousand dollars a month. In terms of like audience size from like Facebook, I think he had a quarter of a million followers on Facebook, Instagram. I'll just pull up the stats now. Most of his fan base were on Facebook, to be honest, more than anything. Sure, sure. So IG looking at only 6,000 followers on Instagram. So yeah, really the bulk of his fan base being on Facebook. Had quite a big email list. I think it was around 19,000 people when he onboarded. So had built up this, you know, really big email list over a long period of time, but wasn't doing a huge amount with it. You know, the only thing he was sending out was um, sales promos every now and again, really like stylized, heavy graphics, like just screamed marketing rather than like taking that personal artist approach that, you know, we we very much like to use at the agency. So that was also one of the things that he really wanted to talk about, like how do I leverage this email list I've built up over the years to to be the best that it can be? Yeah, I think that's super helpful. It's uh, the reason I asked that question is just to kind of give our listeners a baseline of like, what kind of artists are we talking about here? Are we talking about someone who, you know, has a massive audience uh, you know, to the tune of millions, you know, but like you said, we're really talking about an artist that had a healthy following that he had built up, not somebody who was just starting out, but a healthy following that he had built up a lot of work in touring where he could really support himself through playing shows, but a big untapped revenue stream in e-commerce and even with email marketing, like you said. So that's really helpful to kind of get the sense of. So he came to us and said, Hey guys, this is where I'm at with my e-commerce revenue. This is what I've been doing. Uh, this is what my email list is looking like and what I've been up to using it. Based on that, what did we look to do with him kind of knowing those areas of opportunity and those gaps in his marketing and in his fan base, his audience? What did we start to do? What kind of campaigns did we deploy and what effect did we see from that? Yeah, cool. So when he first onboarded as a client. Um, we talked about ad budget and previously to onboarding, they weren't making a huge amount of revenue from their store. They were doing about $9,000 a year from non tour related income, which was really the biggest source of his revenue. Uh, so that those $9,000 a year was only coming from his uh, online store on Shopify. So when he onboarded, he only really wanted to be spending about $500 a month in terms of total ad spend. Um, so when I proposed this type of campaign to him uh, out the gate, for me, I wouldn't really test something like this to a cold audience without at least spending around $50 a day, which obviously uh, quickly adds up and would massively go above that $500 per month ad spend allocation that we had. However, to his credit, he was down to test, you know, uh, for this type of campaign, I'd probably usually run it for around three to four days see how it performs, you know, by that third or fourth day, we should have a really good idea of whether it is going to be profitable, uh, whether it's worth running. So, you know, worst case scenario, you're really looking at uh, gambling with 150 to $200 worth of ad spend. And if it doesn't pan out, you know, we move to the next idea. So to his credit, he was down to test. And that's how we built it out, starting uh, out the gate with $50 a day. We built it as a CBO campaign. Uh, that means co uh, campaign budget optimiz optimization, which means that uh, essentially we're allowing Meta to choose where to allocate the ad spend. We bu built out three different ad sets. So we had a genre a based ad set. It was like classic rock, hard rock, uh, blues, blues rock, really, really broad audiences. And we were only testing in the US and that was the same for all ad sets. The next ad set was artists. So again, super broad, really big bands that were kind of similar or aligned to his interests. So, you know, we're talking about like Slash, uh, Guns N' Roses, B.B. King, Albert King, uh, Greta Van Fleet, Jack White, uh, Joe Bonamassa, uh, tons and tons of artists. The Struts were in there, you know, really, really broad targeting on the artist front. And then for the third ad set, we had it completely wide open with zero targeting, but we were still narrowed down to the US. 
And what's been really interesting about this campaign is that typically when I build out a, a CBO campaign like this and give Facebook uh, or Meta, sorry, I should say, uh, the option of three different types of targeting, it's usually going to pick one and really hone down on it. But for this campaign, we've actually seen a really even split of ad spend across all three ad sets, which has been really interesting. So we haven't actually turned any of it off because they've all been crushing it. They've all done really well and they're basically getting an equal spend. There is a slight skew towards the artist ad set, but genres and wide open are still getting a really, really good amount of spend and great cost per result as well. In terms of the ad build, it was the same across all ad sets. So we were you know, using the same ad, same post ID, stacking the social proof across them. Uh, we've had about four different ads in each uh, ad set with four different music videos. So that's full length uh, creative. You know, We're playing the whole music video. I think that's really important for this type of campaign. Uh, in terms of ad copy, uh, we've gone quite long form because, again, it's a cold audience. So we're trying to build up as much uh, awareness of him as an artist as possible alongside the full length music video for people to get a real taste of the music before they buy the product. So in terms of the copy, uh, it goes like this. Show this to anyone who says rock and roll is dead uh, with the horn emoji. And uh, that really speaks to the avatar. You know, that's a dog whistle. Anyone reading through the newsfeed is going to read that. And if they don't like rock and roll, they're going to scroll right on past. But if it does align with them, you know, it's a very passionate audience. They're definitely going to stick around and read the rest slash watch the video. So the next part of the copy says, my new album is here to say blues rock ain't going anywhere. So again, a really strong statement speaking to the avatar. Uh, we then move into a bit more of, uh, I would say social proof, but it's not really social proof. It's just like backing up the claim, uh, you know, proving that this artist has merit. Uh, and so the, the copy goes, and it just got to number one in the Billboard charts. So to celebrate, I've gone ahead and signed 300 limited edition copies of the album and then the link to the store. So what we're doing there is highlighting the value of the offer, uh, scarcity, the fact that there's only 300 limited edition copies and adding value to them by the fact that they've been signed. And then instantly we're adding a link in there to the store. So if any one has had enough and they're ready to buy, they have the option there. They don't have to scroll through all the copy to get down to the bottom or to the CCA. You know, that link is right there in the first five lines. Uh, but then there's more copy just in case they do need to read more. Uh, and the rest goes ranging from the slick licks of BB King to the electrifying heavy guitars of ACDC. I'm making a statement with my new album, uh, and then the album title. Sorry, I nearly gave away the artist name there. Blues music is thriving and I'm here to shout it from the hills. Not only did it receive such mass appreciation for which I'm so grateful. Guitar World Magazine's readers voted me in the top 30 best blues guitarists in the world today. But don't take my word for it. Anyone can brag right. Hear what the critics have to say. And then we've got a number of different reviews from the press, from magazines, uh, nine out of 10 stars. You know, I'll, I'll give a sample here. You can't get wrong with the new tracks and overall production, and it might be the best album by this artist to date. This record is another winner from this artist, Blues Rock Review, nine out of 10 stars. And we've got a number of those really adding that proof there that this is a great artist and it's a great album. Album. And then at the bottom, we've got So What You Waiting For, Get Bluesified. To celebrate my album going to number one, I've signed 300 limited edition copies. Get yours here before they sell out. And then it goes through to the sales link again. That's fantastic. And I know the rationale behind using the music videos here, but just to dive into it together a little bit, uh, you know, going after cold audiences who, with an artist like this who has some name recognition, especially in the blues space. You know, there might be people who are familiar, but you're likely going to get with such large, broad audiences, you're likely going to be, you know, delivering ads to people who have no idea who you are. So giving them a taste of the music was uh, really a smart choice in terms of using the music videos, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I see that all the time when I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I will see ads from these major label artists where they are just using a photograph or as a tour poster. I've never heard of them. So they're clearly targeting cold audiences and they are trying to sell me either a new album, a pre-order or a tour ticket. And, you know, the chances of me actually seeing a picture or a tour poster and just the band name and that's the only context I have and then taking time out of my day to Google them, search them out on Spotify and listen to them before then making a decision as to whether I want to buy the album or uh, buy a tour ticket. It's just never going to happen and I see that all the time and nothing irritates me more when people are targeting cold audiences and not at least giving a taste of what they sound like in terms of music and video creative. I think that that's an interesting kind of like 
psychological similarity. You know, we're asking people to make a direct purchase after seeing an ad and being presented an, a, a compelling offer here for this artist's record. It's not unlike an ask for a tour in some ways, however, like obviously going and buying a ticket and driving out to a show and going to a venue in some ways is more of an ask, but you're right. Like there's, there is that similarity in, in terms of you know, you're asking somebody to take out their wallet and make a purchase and in some ways make an even deeper commitment going to a show. And if the creative isn't supplying them with enough of a desire, um, and it, for, for us as artists, a lot of times that is like, I need to like this. I need to actually like this music. And whether it is a tour or whether it's a, a new record or a product or whatever it is that you're selling, you know, it's almost the ability to give people a sample. It's the sample at the, you know, little station at the grocery store. Yeah, it's exactly that. You know, people definitely need a taste before they are willing to buy an album or come to a show. You know, like I said before, you are never going to just see a photo of a band uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok or whatever it may be uh, without at least hearing the music and then deciding whether you want to go to a show or buy an album. So there was a massive sort of stack in that copy, long form copy, like you said, a lot of accolades. There was also a lot going on on the offer front in terms of scarcity, urgency around this and even discounting. So really, you guys kind of pulled out all the stops to make this campaign go, which is amazing. Um, I think it was a, some pretty great brainstorming and probably a little bit of tug of war on our front between us and the client and you know what we thought would really help move the needle in the right direction. It's, it's amazing what you can really do when you've got, like I said earlier, this deadly combination of momentum and the ability to tap into paid traffic like this, what you can do around a launch, but also what you can do kind of ongoing. I know you mentioned there was a stack of upsells in the funnel, which is you know something that we really like to use around any kind of campaign that we're running for sales. But also, you know, kind of going back and circling back here to something you mentioned at the beginning, and I'd, I'd like to kind of close with this, is we started building infrastructure for this artist in terms of their e-commerce automations and the retargeting ads and things like that, building that into his marketing stack. What direction do you see going now? This campaign's continuing to run, and obviously it has you know juice to be squeezed out of it in terms of more revenue and more sales with over a thousand customers created for an artist that really wasn't doing much in e-commerce to begin with as we kind of kicked off. Where do you kind of see the trajectory going here um, as we move into the rest of this year? Yeah, so now that we're building so many brand new fans for this artist, the next thing that we really pivoted to uh, over the course of the last month or so uh, was a vinyl sale for the same album in a really cool limited edition gold variant, only targeting his warm audience. So all the new people that were uh, getting into the funnel and also his previous existing fans from before he onboarded as a client. Uh, bless him, he only bought 50 mailers uh, vinyl mailers, that is, not thinking that we'd sell that many because he'd never really sold that many vinyl before. And in the past three weeks, we've sold 250 vinyls to his warm audience. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of people that have ordered those vinyls have been from the new fans that we've been generating over the last few months. Uh, and it's crazy, you know, since he onboarded his client, he's made $51,000 in his online store compared to 9,000 in the entire previous 12 months. Uh, from before he onboarded, which is crazy. Yeah, that is amazing. It's such a great result. And I'm thrilled to be working with this artist. He's a joy. Obviously, like he's a blast to work with. He's very creative. It's been awesome to see the results of, you know, these initial campaigns that we've gotten to gotten to launch together. I'm super excited in a similar way. And this is something that we do with a lot of artists that are generating a ton of new first time customers is the next thing that you need to do is work to ascend those people into second time buyers and really operate like an e-commerce operation would. Work to ascend those customers into a second sale. It's amazing that we were able to sell out of the uh, the expected amount of vinyl really quick and then multiply it by five. <laughs> um, that's that's amazing. And you know, for an artist that's never sold vinyl before, that's great. Yeah, it's been incredible. And now we're really just mapping out the rest of the year uh, with a new album, sales offers throughout the year, because he's 
been an artist for such a long time. He's got a really lengthy career. He's also released a lot of albums, which means that we have a lot of anniversary dates across the year for previous album anniversary sales. So he's not going to be running out of any content or any sales promos anytime soon. Yeah, that is super good. And that's kind of a key takeaway here. If you're working on a release and you've got a backlog of merch, content, products, previous records, the next thing to really be focused on, and this is a lot of what we do at the agency with artists that do start to generate a number of sales, like I said, is looking to get customer ascension going. And if you've got you know, a product set in your store that you can then turn into offers, that's really what we love to do here at the agency. And I'm super excited to see where the you know continued success of this client's account goes, what we can continue to do with his marketing. Man, this was so much fun to dive into. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to unpack it with me and kind of talk about it here. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a lot of fun as always. Yeah, for sure. Well, well, I hope you guys dug what we talked about here today and hopefully some of the takeaways that we had in terms of what you can do in your own music career, both from the copy side of things the ad account structuring and the campaign structuring, what kind of creatives you can be using, really your messaging, and ultimately what you can do to capitalize on the momentum that you've got going on in your music career. But this was super fun to unpack. I hope you guys liked hearing the story of what we were able to do with this artist in terms of helping him tap in and capitalize on his charting position and grow his e-commerce revenue, drive over a thousand customers in a relatively short period of time, bring up his ad spend to beyond what he was looking to do and really spend and sell more merch than he thought he was uh, going to be able to. So I hope you guys dug this story. We'll be back next time on Creative Juice to dive into more music marketing goodness. We'll see you guys then. Peace out, Indies.